see all of you and uh, a bit more on time this time, so uh, it's always a good uh, improvement from the last time. Well, so, um, okay, yeah, that never happen. Uh, the cable. Yeah, I think that's a doggy cable. Okay. Remind me if the, if the slide goes black at any point and I'm not going to get it, but it uh, should be fine. So, uh, yeah, uh, this, uh, this time around, I'm going to try and cover a bit more technical detail on um, electric motors. So, uh, last week we had a bit more of a look at the overview of the entire vehicle powertrain, but um, yeah, this is the first uh, seminar where we're going to go and look into a bit more detail into uh, how a motor actually works and hopefully cover some interesting parts in the meantime. Um, yeah, so that's the slide, don't care about that. Let's jump straight in. Um, so some of you will recognise this um, yeah, this slide from the previous, um, uh, previous presentation. So uh, essentially highlighting the fact that um, there's a whole load of electric motor types out there and uh, you've got a lot of flexibility um, in how you want to get a motor to actually spin. Um, partly because there's so many different types of applications for electric motors. Um, but uh, yeah, in our particular case, we really care about obviously motors for traction in a car, um, in which case we can narrow it down to permanent magnet AC motors, which are um, the most common for that, uh, well, for that use case. So uh, looking a little bit at all the different types there, I've covered the slide last time as well, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but, um, but yeah, just to, just to indicate Essentially, with electric motors, there's a whole choice out there, and uh, we really care about that little subsection, the permanent magnet AC part. Um, IPM and SPM will come on to, but, um, but yeah, that's to give a, a rough idea. So, what does a motor contain? Um, put simply, it's a stator and a rotor, if you want to break it up into the most basic parts, that are then driven electrically to um, cause rotation. So in terms of the basic components, uh, the bulk of the motor and the bulk of the weight of the motor is, um, is well, held in the stator. So that's obviously the thing that sits still and doesn't rotate. Um, and the, yeah, it can generally be categorized as the, well, any, any motor's got the stator. So, uh, so that's always the, the large part that houses the, uh, the electromagnetic when winding is. Uh, the other part is the rotor which uh, normally houses the magnets, and uh, that's obviously where it spins. Um, and then the main parts that we care about in terms of the electromagnetics are the slots and the poles. So the slots is a term used to refer to the, um, to the coil or the windings on the, on the stator, and the poles is essentially just the magnets that are on the, uh, that are on the uh, rotor. So the poles always come in pairs, because obviously positive and negative attract, um, and the um, coils on the stator um, are always multiples of three. So if you set out to make your motor, you probably don't want to just have you know, six, uh, six slots and two poles. You want to have a combination of, uh, of a number of them, because um, more poles and more slots gives you different operating characteristics. Um, yeah, so the picture to the next, to the to the right of that, is just an indication of what a two-pole rotor looks like and what an eight-pole rotor looks like. So, um, yeah, whenever you see the word poles, that yeah, usually just refers to the number of magnets, essentially. Um, let's see. Yeah, so if we wanted to classify this particular, that motor picture on the, in the middle, that would be a three-phase, four-pole, six-slot machine. Um, and uh, again, it's one of those things that in literature we like to go crazy about, but uh, that's really the core of it. And uh, it doesn't get too much more complicated than that. So just to give a slightly different example, in this particular case, the one that's just appeared on the board, um, that would be a three-phase machine again. It's an eight-pole machine because it's got the eight magnets on the rotor, and then 24 slots distributed evenly around the circumference of the stator. And the main reason for having different, um, well, you can kind of start to see that more, um, more slots tends to be better overall because you have a more even distribution of 
um, what, what bits essentially that create your rotating electric field, uh, magnetic field, and um, that causes a smoother uh, field overall. But there is a limit. Um, once you get to a certain number of slots and poles, you definitely lose that benefit. So uh, it's really an optimization problem for the motor designer as, a, as the actual configuration that they arrive at. Um, okay, so that's recentered slightly, but that should really say in roller versus out roller. So the, there's two different types, again, in terms of uh, how the rotor is positioned. So you tend to have in roller motors, which um, have the rotor at the center of the stator, and purely the rotation is at the center of that uh, stator. And you also have um, out, well, out runners, which, um, which still obviously rotate the, the shaft of rotation is in the center of the stator, but instead of the, just the middle part spinning, the whole of the outside casing spins. Um, it's two main, main kind of different types obviously due to the different uh, uh, applications that exist. Um, in the runner motors tend to be much more common for traction applications. Out runner motors tend to be, well, you tend to see them a lot on RC, uh, on RC motors especially. So um, things like drones and the MRAX uh, 2i as well in particular, that was originally designed for an aircraft. So um, even though we are using an NW2 at the moment, um, yeah, that's kind of the reason why the outrunner motors achieve quite a good um, power density with them and the configuration is the same thing except it's just uh, obviously your slots and poles reverse and they on the outrunners your um, your poles tend to sit on the outside of the of the ring um, and the slots are on the inside of the stator well all of these tires just uh, wonder why that is but yeah so that's clashing a little bit, but um, the other main difference you see in uh, electric motors are the windings. So um, you have a choice of distributed winding or concentrated windings. Uh, concentrated windings tend to be um, a lot easier to make and a lot easier to manufacture, but um, the distributed windings have a lot more variation in terms of your torque response. So um, most of the time, people um, people opt for a winding choice. They go with distributed windings uh, simply because of the well, the smoothness you get in the electromagnetic field and also the the, the um, yeah the flexibility you've got. So the other thing, um, your winding type determines the shape of the vacuum F that is generated by the um, by the coils. So whenever you uh, if you spin a rotor without an, an inverter being attached, um, if you spin just a rotor, you will be generating um, electromagnetic, well, an electromagnetic field in the, in the stator, which will then, as a result, generate a voltage on the coils. So um, uh, that's also the case when you're actually driving it with an inverter. It's the same if you're uncoupled. So the shape of this vacuum F uh, voltage uh, is dependent on the choice of windings. So uh, you can kind of see with concentrated windings, you tend to get this more trapezoidal shape where um, you have a lot more harmonics in the waveform, um, which causes the, the clipping. Um, but um, yeah, with the distributed winding, you can achieve a much nicer waveform, essentially. Um, yeah, and distributed is a lot more common for uh, motors, electric motors. That's a shame all the titles have gone, but that's all right. Um, so yeah, um, when uh, when people generate or design electric motors, they like to um, show the actual winding distribution on uh, on this type of diagram. So uh, it's not really it's not really um, any importance, but it's more just for information. Um, so essentially, what you do is you take your your slot arrangement and you lay it out vertically or horizontally, and then um, you can kind of show how your windings are arranged around the, the stator. So in the first image on the left, you can kind of see we've got a single coil around the, um, well, a single coil wound around the slot, and then that gets transferred onto, um, onto the diagram on the bottom. Um, and then if you do that for all the coils around the stator, you can then start to show the interconnection between of them. So um, yeah, for example, concentrated windings, you can clearly see that um, 
coils are literally just wound around single poles. Um, so then you kind of have these interconnecting segments between of them, but the distributed windings cover two or more uh, slots essentially, and uh, that's reflected in these diagrams. And the key thing to note about this is that the number of turns on the wire can be varied on each uh, coil, which is quite important for um, for how the actually well how the motor actually actually works. We'll see shortly. Yeah, so one of the uh, other differences or main characteristics of electric motors is the, uh, the flux direction. So uh, this is really just to indicate the direction in which the, mag the magnetic field acts. Um, so radial flux, um, well with radial flux your flux acts radially, um, which is quite obvious. Um, and that's basically perpendicular to, the, to your axis of rotation. Um, actual flux is in the same direction as the axis of your rotation. So that means that your mag will sit flat on the surface of the rotors as opposed to on the outside. Um, and as I covered last week as well, uh, actual flux tends to be better for high torque. Um, radial flux is better if you want to get to high speeds. But, uh, but yeah, both of them are very common, uh, commonly used um, in all sorts of configurations. Um, another um, difference or classification you get in electric motors is the position of the magnets themselves on the rotor. So uh, the two major types there are surface permanent magnets and interior permanent magnets, which are roughly in, in the, illustrated on the images below. Um, with surface mounted magnets, um, it tends to be easier to, man to, well, to manufacture the, the rotors. Um, you do tend to be able to um, well, you don't quite get as much speed out of them, and you're normally limited by the type of glue you use to hold your magnets in place. Um, whereas with an IPM motor, your magnets are embedded inside of the rotor, and uh, that really well, causes your magnets to be more uh, more permanent fixed, and also it's easier to uh, to cool them as well. So there's a few benefits and drawbacks uh, between the two topologies. Um, the thing to note that with IPM motors, the, um, because your magnets are not equally aligned, you get different inductance characteristics depending on the rotation of your rotor, um, which causes, um, well, causes quite a few interesting things in a way. But um, yeah, it means you, you can utilize a thing called reluctance torque, which uh, you cannot do with surface map permanent magnets. Um, but we'll cover that a bit later. So just to give a few examples, and again the titles are messed up, which is really starting to annoy me, but uh, that's fine. The, um, yeah, so this is an example of a um, surface permanent magnet motor, um, the Yasa P400R. So it's, well, many of you will recognize this as the slightly older brother of the motor used in WE1. Um, you can kind of see all of the main components there. So uh, I've also got the stator in the middle. This particular one is a dual rotor type, so you've got two rotors as opposed to one, and then you can kind of see that the magnets are mounted on the parallel surface of your rotor. And um, yeah, the Yasa motor is obviously quite well known for its power density, um, and it's been used effectively in quite a few, um, well, especially motorsports applications, because of the uh, yeah, mainly because of the power density. To be fair. That figure of 370 newton meters is quite nice. You can do quite a lot of wheel spin with that. Oh, that was the wrong key. And again, the title is wrong. But yeah, so this is more an example of a interior permanent magnet motor. So, uh, well, it's different in a few, a few other topology areas as well. As a start, we've got a single rotor there. So uh, that's obviously the bit in the center, um, which is uh, highlighted there. You can kind of see that the the actual rotor itself has been machined to light work well for light weighting, but uh, the rotors, um, well, the magnets in the rotor are aligned kind of actually inside of the the rotor itself. So um, yeah, the direction of rotation of those magnets are uh, in the same axis as the um, axis of rotation. It's quite an interesting rotor as well um, because it's generates a reasonable amount of power um, and it's 
not in the liquid form. So uh, this is a particular one that they used in the zero electric motorbikes. I know how many of you uh, can see those, but uh, that's probably the main manufacturer of uh, electric motorbikes at the moment. It's got a four different range, and uh, this is this is actually a motor that they developed themselves in house after uh, not being happy enough with the performance of other alternatives. And then, so the third one is the MRAX 208, which um, again is used in W1. Um, this particular one's interesting because it's, uh, it's obviously an outweller. So uh, that's the first example that out of the three, where the, uh, the whole of the casing, the black part, just uh, spins, which is, uh, it actually makes it quite a lot more annoying to work with for um, the particular application that we're trying to use it for. Uh, because it means that you've got to cover the whole rotating surface, especially because of uh, former student rules. So uh, it's not really ideal in that sense, but um, yeah, in terms of the power and performance, it's uh, quite nice. So um, yeah, you can kind of identify the, the main characteristics there. Um, I found this quite nice breakdown uh, where someone took the whole thing apart online, and uh, that's well, what it looks like essentially. So you've got the whole stator or the middle image, um, and then the rotor, it's a, so it's a single rotor in this case, um, just uh, sits on the top of that and uh, spins around. The, um, the winding pattern on this one is actually concentrated as well. You can kind of see that from the segmented parts in the, in the armature. Um, so that's also quite unusual for um, permanent magnet AC motors, to be fair. But uh, MRAX have made it work, so it's obviously possible. Um, thing to note with this one as well, it's got a lot of poles. So it's got 20 poles, which is a lot more than what you see in a lot of the different uh, alternatives. But um, yeah, it's obviously that particular magnet type works well for them. And uh, they've done well with the um, volume buys. Um, but yeah, so that's what that looks like on the inside. So, a little bit more um, detail as to how they work. Um, I covered this briefly last week, but I uh, just want to go into a little bit more detail. So, um, the real target or the goal with uh, PMAC motors is to, um, well, obviously achieve smooth rotation. And the way we do this is by generating a rotating electromagnetic field on the stator. And then because the, there's magnets on the, um, well, there's permanent magnets on the rotor are obviously attracted to um, the opposite ends of the field, the rotor will spin and follow that field which you're generating. Um, and that really causes um, yeah, your speed, especially in your torque generation, to be quite accurate and controllable. So that's obviously a very, um, a very well, good aspect for uh, traction. Because uh, yeah, you don't want your motor to be... Uh, like to have a lot of torque ripple or to be you know, uncontrollable essentially. So in terms of yeah that's right, that's just not great is it? But so in terms of um, yeah conceptually I'm not going to go into too much too much too many equations because that's uh, that bores everyone. I don't think that's really the most useful at the end of the day. Um, but at its core um, we've got three phases in, in uh, most electric motors. You can actually have more than three phases, but uh, a lot of the time you don't really need it. Uh, a lot of the time you can get away with three. Um, but each phase is literally, if you simplify it down to its most basic form, is just a coil of wire. So um, you've essentially got your, each of your phases is a combination of, um, of coils, and uh, that is. Um, well, overall, that gets added and subtracted in particular series and parallel forms to give you an overall winding uh, for that particular phase. And um, that particular phase has got a inductance and a uh, resistance. Because obviously, ideally, you wouldn't have any resistance, but that's, um, you know, you can't get away from it. That's just a characteristic uh, of the wire. And um, your inductance largely dictates your um, the actual torque you can generate with the motor itself. Um, so each of the phases you can approximate as a combination of an overall resultant inductance and a resistance. And that's very often how you'll see um, diagrams as well. So of an electric motor, um, that, that'll be the format that it's presented in. But uh, essentially 
your uh, well, what you're doing is you're trying to control the current through that inductance because um, a change in current through an inductance will create um, well a flux inside of a conductor, and um, because you've got a linkage between your rotor and your stator, um, you're essentially um, yeah you can essentially influence the field on the rotor that way. So um, so you you not well you control the current through each of your phases by putting a voltage on the um, on the phase. So um, essentially that's the only way you can control the current through your phases as well. So um, the higher your voltage, the higher your current, but uh, obviously you're limited by what your uh, actual controller can supply in terms of voltage and uh, you're limited by components as well. So uh, let's see. Yeah, so the aim normally is to try and keep the inductance and the resistance of the individual coils small um, but you can get away with a lot of that by putting coils in parallel because uh, that way you're essentially reducing the resistance and the inductance by quite a lot so a lot of coil windings on motors will uh, have quite intricate systems of um, yeah, series of parallel combinations of your coils and the goal really is to keep those small um, because you're trying to reduce the voltage drop as much as possible because um, because essentially we're using voltage to generate current through each of those coils um, the inductance and resistance components each will um, generate their own voltage which opposes the voltage that you're driving it with so um, the higher the higher for instance your resistance the higher your vacuum f that gets dropped across that resistance so you really want to minimize that as much as you can. So um, coils really are yeah, in the micro, micro Henry and milliohm range for um, many PMAC motors, which tends to be a fairly good area for it to uh, operate. And the uh, real goal is to keep all of the three phases balanced. So um, this is what that can look like in practice. We've essentially got our three phases aligned in a Y configuration and they're all connected um, at a neutral point. And um, yeah, obviously manufacturing tolerances and the way that coils are normally made do mean that you get some slight variation in your coil resistance and inductance across your phases. But um, yeah, it's really a challenge to keep that the same because otherwise you start to get unbalanced um, behavior on your motor, which you don't want essentially. But, um, but yeah, that's the, that's the core of the um, that's the core of the difficulty in generating um, PMAC motors, is the way how you set up your, uh, your windings, essentially. Um, so, normally to make it a bit more, well, a bit easier to understand, people um, make what they call these winding diagrams. So the one that I showed a few slides ago was just one, uh, one example of that. Obviously you get some slightly more visual ones as well, such as this one here. Um, and uh, once you kind of start to, once you start to break this down, it's a lot easier to see what's actually going on. So in this particular motor, we've got um, four, uh, well, four essentially coils per, um, per phase, and um, you can kind of see that. We, so if, if we take it, the um, well, we start from the A phase down to the neutral point. You've got the first coil at um, about three o'clock, the second coil at twelve o'clock. The third coil at uh, roughly nine o'clock, and then um, yeah, the fourth coil roughly down to six o'clock, and uh, they're all they're all connected in series, which uh, causes your resultant uh, coil um, arrangement essentially. And um, yeah, obviously each of these wires, when they go into a phase, the number of turns that they or the number of times that they're wrapped around that coil can vary. So we could have, for instance five turns on the, on the, on the rightmost one, 10 turns on the top. Um, the, yeah, they're essentially, so all of the three phases are equally distributed around the, um, the stator. Um, and that's again, coming back to our, we can only have um, slot multiples in the, in, which are divisible by three, because we want uh, to match um, well, the number that we have on our, on our phases. Um, yeah, I think that, covers that one pretty much. Um, and that title again is in the way. It's really just not worth 
Um, so yeah, the way that we are, well, that we're actually able to generate a smooth uh, field around the stator is by separating each of the phases um, and varying their distribution, essentially. So uh, in one particular orientation, that means that our magnetic field is acting very strongly for one particular phase. And then for the other two phases, that's the same, but it's offset by 120 degrees. Um, and that really causes, well, that really helps with, uh, with, the, with the, gradual, um, or the gradual movement of the rotor, essentially. So um, we, can, we can generate this sinusoidal distribution by varying the number of turns on each coil. So, um, so this is where your choice of the number of coils that you go with on your, on your stator has a big influence. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we can, by essentially, well, if we take for instance phase, phase A, for example, um, we can have very tightly wound coils at the, at the bottom and the top of that, of that circle, uh, which means that most of our electric, well, magnetic field is being generated um, there. And then we're winding our coils less tightly in other areas. And we're doing the same with the two other phases. Um, that's really kind of the, well, that's how you, how you can get a, um, a smooth, generate smooth field around your stator. So this is potentially a slightly more visual instrument in the, well, way of representing that. But um, yeah, if we were to look at that in real time, so essentially this is a, uh, well, this is just essentially a rotor spinning at, um, at the constant frequency. Um, you can kind of see that if we follow the, um, well, if we follow each of the components, uh, they each, they are offset um, 120 degrees and, uh, and they reach their peaks at each of those 120 degree spacings. Um, if you add the resultant vectors of each of those points um, and, well, and take them and add them up, you can add them, you can uh, put them onto a space vector diagram, which, uh, well, if you add them all up, you can, you can uh, obtain that smoothly rotating vector, which is what we're all about. And the uh, important thing to note here is that we can actually achieve any angle of that rotating field by just controlling the, um, yeah, the magnitudes of each of those three phases. And uh, that obviously really helps um, with um, generating that rotating field. Um, yeah, let's see, it's probably covered that. And uh, well, I guess the only thing to note is that we do use both of the directions on each of the phases. So, um, yeah, because obviously sine waves just do it a lot, they wiggle over a lot of space. Um, we need to use both directions there to, um, yeah, to cover the whole um, period, essentially. Yeah, that's how I did the job. Oh well. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you put that all onto a single figure, that is what that looks like, or that is what that can look like. Um, slightly confusing, but um, essentially you can see in the middle on the three on the red, blue, and uh, green phase arrows there, you can kind of see that when that reaches the peak value, we are also reaching a peak at the resultant. Um, so if you, for instance, have a look at the, um, well, let's see, at the red arrow here, our red, our red phase gets to maximum when the resultant passes by. So uh, it's quite a nice way of visualizing that, in that you're gradually putting in more current to each of the phases to, um, to add to the components there. And this is again where we can get our relationships. So the faster the frequency of this rotating um, uh, field on the stator, um, the quicker your motor will spin because, uh, yeah, essentially the frequency is, is a direct result of the resultant uh, vector that you're generating. So uh, the faster your AC waves that you're putting into the current, that, well, that you're putting into the phases, the faster your resultant uh, vector will spin. Um, and the other thing is, if we increase the magnitude of each of those vectors, um, the overall resultant will also be increased. So um, that then represents a higher torque because uh, the amount of current that you're putting into your stator really um, yeah, really determines the torque that you will get out of the motor. And for those of you who are interested, 
that's the equations. I'm not going to cover them too much, but they're in the um, they're in the PowerPoint. If you want to have a look at it in more detail, or plot them out yourself. Um, but yeah, that's the idea behind it. So, just to cover a few um, important parameters, essentially for motors. One of the most important is the vacuum F um, constant, because that. Is essentially a constant that determines your um, your voltage that's being generated on the phases for a certain RPM that your motor is spinning. Um, and as I kind of alluded to uh, before, um, this vacuum F opposes the um, well, essentially opposes the maximum voltage that you can put in. So this the value of this vacuum F determines where the end of your constant torque region lies and where your field weakening starts. Um, so I've kind of yeah, I've kind of explained it in a few more steps there, but um, yeah, the main thing to take away from that is that the vacuum F constant determines where your field weakening starts. So uh, if we look at the uh, well, at it in equation form, um, the uh, the vacuum F constant is essentially if you multiply that by your velocity, you get your voltage, your phase voltage out. Um, so if we plot that on a graph, obviously it's going to be a nice straight line. So the higher your speed, the higher your vacuum F voltage. Um, however, because your inverter is limited by a certain deceiving voltage, um, once you reach a certain part on that, so well, once you reach that certain speed and you reach that certain deceiving voltage, that means you can't really go any further because you can't. You don't have the potential difference across your coils, which uh, means you can generate the phase current required. Um, so once you hit that limit, that is what is referred to as the base speed of a motor. Um, and in a lot of other cases, the base speed would just decide your uh, final or maximum velocity of the motor. But uh, we can use some clever schemes to get past that, essentially, um, which is also where field weakening comes in. The other useful parameter slash constant is the torque constant. So uh, this is not quite as constant as you'd like um, because it's quite dependent on, for instance, your magnet temperature and uh, your, um, well, even just uh, your uh, uh, coil temperatures as well. But, uh, but yeah, in the, in the constant torque region of a motor, so before field weakening, uh, your torque constant essentially represents the amount of torque you're going to get out for a particular phase current you put in. So, um, yeah, so it's quite a useful figure to visualize what's going on. Uh, units of that are normally newton meters per amp. So, uh, if we say put in, well, if that's got a value of 10, if you're putting in um, 10 amps of phase current, you're going to get 100 newton meters out, essentially. Um, but yeah, it's not as linear as we'd like. So, this is quite a useful parameter, but it's also not critical um, as in that sense, but uh, it's useful to know about in a way. So if someone gives you a certain figure of phase current that you're putting in, you can say, I'm probably going to get roughly this torque out. Um, so the other uh, thing to cover is some of the performance. So as I kind of alluded to previously, um, this is generally what a torque speed curve looks like for electric motors. So a constant torque region is really the part that we care about most and we ideally want to spend the majority of time in there for, for our operational cycle because uh, well, we can obviously get peak torque out continuously. So we don't need to worry about the field weakening at all and we're going to get the most efficiency out. Um, most of the time. Um, the problem is, obviously, at a particular speed, um, the vacuum F generated by the motor, because you're spinning at that particular speed, is going to be too high, uh, and we're going to be limited on our voltage. Um, at that point, we enter the constant power region, which is, um, which is essentially the motor in that period tries to uh, maintain a constant, uh, constant power, but the torque is dropping because the speed is increasing. So uh, as I'm sure everyone knows, um, power is, well, speed times torque. So um, yeah, if your speed increases, the torque has to drop if we're going to maintain a constant power 
Um, that's well. Th this is also normally the um, the region where you're getting your um, yeah. You, well, your peak power normally happens halfway in this region somewhere, and then we normally start to drop towards the end of that region. Um, at one particular point, which we refer to as the high speeds region, um, we essentially cannot sustain the amount of power anymore, and this is where your torque starts to drop massively, and uh, this is where your power will also drop as a result, and um, yeah, the motor will just stop working at that point if you try to get any torque out of it. So uh, that's really the, the limit, if you will. Um, but uh, for most electric motors, they tend to be designed that you, well, you obviously never really reach that region. You normally go to maybe 70% of the constant power region um, in operation. Ideally, even less than that. Ideally, we want to spend most of our time in the constant torque region, but uh, that's up to the designer. Um, so we can kind of see there again, that's the, uh, the base speed. So uh, the base speed is the start of that constant power region um, where we need to start dropping our torque to um, maintain what's going on. Um, so, as I kind of uh, mentioned before, field weakening is a very interesting concept in uh, where we actually, well, that's quite a good name for it to be fair, because field weakening is, is exactly what we're trying to do. So, um, we're trying to weaken the um, field that is generated by the permanent magnets, because obviously, if the permanent magnets spin up at a different speed, they generate a certain amount of voltage, which you've reached a threshold of. Uh, if we weaken the, the magnetic field generated by the magnets, that means we can actually generate less vacuum F voltage. Um, and that means that we can push further into our speed region. So um, unfortunately, that also comes as a trade-off uh, because we need to uh, supply, well, we need to split that into, we need to essentially use a, uh, a part of the current uh, to do this field weakening. So um, often what we do is we split the uh, the current into IQ and ID, uh, which stands for um, quadrature and direct axes, but uh, the yeah, that's just convention. Um, the useful, well, the, the, the important thing to take away from that is just that the IQ current is the part that is useful to us, so that's the thing that's creating torque. Um, ID current is the current we're using to weaken the field. So essentially, we have to do it. We don't want to do it, but we have to. So that portion of the phase current that you're putting in is um, is yeah, essentially wasted, if you will. But um, we need it. We need it. So uh, can't get away from it. It's uh, normally quite a good thing to plot it out. Quite a useful thing to plot it out in graphical form. So. Um, yeah, if you read any kind of literature or papers or motors, you will normally see people drawing circles all over the place because they like they like circles, exactly for that reason. Um, but so the, yeah, normally the axes are ID on the x-axis and IQ on the y-axis. Um, the thing to note is that ID is always negative because it's always going well. It's always going in the opposite direction of your useful current. So really, the only quadrant that we're using is the uh, well, the, the left hand um, top quadrant essentially, but uh, we include the rest of the circle just for inclusion. So um, yeah, um, if we if we think about this logically, um, essentially what that means is that the outside of that circle is the magnitude of your actual of your total phase current available. So uh, so say you've got a motor that's limited to six hundred amps per phase, um, that circle represents the, um, well, your components, essentially. So um, before base speed, um, what that looks like is that we can get the maximum or all of the phase current is going towards IQ. So that is what uh, that is what that would look like on the diagram before base speed. Um, obviously, the magnitude of that vector is just dependent on your on how much phase current you're putting in. If you're say putting in 100 amps per phase, uh, you know you're actual resultant vector would not hit the line, it would just be shorter in length. But uh, but at maximum phase current, we are essentially putting in all IQ at the peak uh, possible value. If we're in field weakening, uh, we need to start some ID current. So essentially, this is where your limit uh, starts to, or your limit line starts to move left. Um, and um, yeah, obviously the higher your 
the higher your speed or the more field weakening that you need to do, uh, the shallower that line becomes because you start to move more and more by the current to reach your particular speed. Um, and at the same time, we can see that um, the IQ or the available portion of IQ current starts to drop because obviously our phase current, uh, well, our vector is moving down. So if we actually look at the maximum achievable um, IQ value, that drops further and further with, uh, with, by, with the more ID you're putting in or the higher speed you're going. So, um, yeah, that's uh, it's quite a useful representation for several things, really. But uh, interesting anecdote. Um, so the problem is with well, the problem with the torque constant was that we're not really taking into account the field weakening range. So um, now we've split up our current into ID and IQ components, we can actually form a nice, useful equation for that in terms of IQ, because obviously IQ represents the, um, well, it's directly related to the amount of torque you can get out, or that's a useful portion of the base current. So once we've split up, split up into ID and IQ, uh, we, our torque just becomes a, well, a, um, becomes proportional to the amount of IQ we're putting in, um, and that's obviously got a few constants in there. So the number of four pairs and the, um, the permanent flux that you're actually uh, able to generate through the windings. Um, but, um, but yeah, they, well, they're, they're not quite, the number of poles is constant, the permanent flux linkage will vary with temperature, but uh, it's essentially constant. So uh, yeah, the torque is roughly proportional to IQ. Graphically, what that looks like is, um, this is, well, this is a good example. So um, we, when we, we don't have any ID current at all up to the base speed, when we hit base speed, ID starts to increase and our torque starts to drop as a result. So um, yeah, that's, um, that's really ID and IQ for you there. The um, other thing that is uh, an interesting thing to know about is the variation with your dieseling voltage. So now we've gone through the motions of, especially what the black EMF uh, constant is and what ID and IQ are, uh, we can now start to look at what happens if you've got more diesel link voltage available. So if we've got a higher diesel link voltage, that means we've got more power uh, available that we can, uh, that we can, well, tap into essentially, given we can still take the same amount of current out. And um, what we're also doing directly by increasing the DC link uh, voltage, um, we can, we're essentially increasing the speed that we can get to before we need to go into field weakening. So, um, so yeah, the base speed essentially moves forward with an increase in VDC. So what this looks like on the graph, um, this is at a lower VDC voltage. This would be at a higher VDC voltage. So our actual achievable power in green has uh, gone up and uh, our torque has extended to the right on the, uh, on the speed axis. So if we compare that to the lower one as well, we can kind of see that the higher the DC link voltage, um, the higher the base speed, and as, as a result, a whole torque uh, speed curve shifts to the right. Um, and this is quite an important property because uh, that also means that, uh, well, I suppose that's uh, also how you see it commonly denoted in, uh, in performance graphs. So um, if you ever see this particular kind of layout, uh, that just means that at the maximum VDC voltage, you can get your maximum torque out or your maximum power. But uh, the more your DC link voltage drops, the more your maximum power drops as well. Um, the important thing to note with this is, is that it's obviously in cars, this is um, your battery voltage drops as you, um, as you discharge it. So that also means that your available power um, drops with your, um, well, as the battery discharges. So uh, if you're designing a car, you need to be quite careful to design for the maximum or the minimal, uh, the maximum discharge characteristic of the battery, and that you're still getting a reasonable power out of the motor, um, because otherwise you just come to a standstill and no one's going to buy your vehicle. Um, so yeah, I didn't want to make that one too long. So um, 
I don't know if someone's got any questions, but uh, I'd be happy to answer them now. And uh, we've also got the standard PDR for it from there for the people that are interested. So, yeah, go for it. Um, how are the magnets mounted from the actual zigs and bolts? They tend to be glued in. So um, people tend to use quite high temperature adhesive to stick them on to the rotor, essentially. Um, I think all the all the people have to, well, all the people also um, essentially make it so that the surface of the rotor fits the magnets exactly. So all the glue is doing is just holding them in place. Because obviously you've got quite a lot of uh, problems um, with the adhesion strength of the glue. Um, but yeah, they, they tend to be glued in most of the time. So that's different than, or that's stronger than the SPM. Uh, no, no, no. So so the SPM is really the um, yeah, the, the way that it's that's just showing how it's how it's done normally, okay. and uh, that's yeah, that's what we use as glue. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Anyone else? How do you actually do field weakening? How do you do field weakening? Well, the controller does it for you, really. Um, but uh, essentially, what happens is the yeah, so the controller does all the calculations to calculate the what your phase voltages are and uh, what your available view current is. Um, and then once you start to reach that base speed, um, the controller starts to limit the, uh, the amount of RQ that you can start to take and put in. And um, yeah, it's, it's, um, the calculation of RQ and ID is quite nice because it essentially maps a, um, it maps a moving target to quite a straight line. So it's quite easy for the controller to calculate that. I didn't really go into too much detail as to how, yeah, how field weakening and space vector modulation in particular works, but um, but yeah, we'll kind of see see that there, I think as well. Um, but yeah, essentially the controller, the controller takes care of most of it. So, uh, yeah, it's quite a. Um, it's also like inverters have been around for quite a long time, so it's quite a developed concept, if you will. Um, Yeah. Everyone else happy? Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone.